words are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know, I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, and is teaching and be, and be gilling, I'm sorry, be gilling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I give her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress, unless they repent of her doings, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, you have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you I say, I do not lay on you any other burdens, only hold fast to what you have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works, to the end, I will give authority over the nations, to rule them with an iron rod, as when clay pots are shattered, even as I also receive authority from my Father. To the one who conquers, I will also give the morning star. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. But it's, it's interesting to look over time how people have done letters. Um, I, got, I got an email from my daughter. This is my granddaughter. Her name is Aubrey. She lives in Gainesville. And she had this interesting day at school, and my daughter sent me this picture. It was uh, the school. The school was 100 years old, or something was 100 years old. And so they asked all the kids to dress up like they were 100. And that, so that's what she's going to look like when she's 100. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was pretty cute. And to look ahead, and I thought, well, what about you guys? How many of you? What grade are you in right now? First, third.
Under she goes. And we baptized her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And she came out a child of God. It was amazing. All sorts of fun things happen as you get older. They do some more study in there, learning some stuff about God and about the church. And here's some of you. Some of you went to your first communion class a couple of weeks ago and took your first communion. And I just wanted to give you a glimpse into the future. And how, who knows how we're going to be communicating when the, when the future comes. Maybe people will be able to read our minds. Holy Spirit. So anyway, God is communicating with us, and he wrote this, he had John write this letter, and you know what the message of the letter was? Guess what Jesus said? I love you guys. I love you. And you can do all sorts of wonderful things for me. So anyway, thank you for coming out and being a part of uh, the tour into the future, and I hope you guys have a wonderful week and week to come. Thanks for coming out. We're going to do the game.
write letters? Some of you, some of you do. And it's not an age thing necessarily, or a generational thing. Like my mom used to write letters, and I never really was very good. At, well, when Jan and I were in love, and she was in Florida and I was in Texas, wrote a lot of things, but it was basically three words I left her love with. It's a little redundant. But we wrote a lot. It seems so, as, like I said, said to the kids, it's different today. It seems like uh, now when you want to send a message, you got to boil it down to a 140 character tweet, which means uh, 140 characters means uh, that includes letters, punctuation, and spaces. You can't say it then, you can't say it. But sometimes you just have to go back. You gotta, you gotta write. You gotta talk. You have to, you have to say what's in your heart, what things going on, about things that you want to change, things that you love. I'm gonna share with you some letters, uh, and see if you can tell me who wrote them and on what the occasion it was to whom they wrote. Okay? This first one. I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century B.C. left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord and as far beyond the boundaries of their own, own homes, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so I am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Martin Luther King Jr., right, got it. Do you know who he wrote it to? He wrote it to Christian pastors. And do you know where he was when he wrote it? Jail. He was in jail in Birmingham. Here's another one. Who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three man years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting the product, and distributing it for free? The fact that no one is that no one besides us has invested a lot of money in hobby software. But there's very little incentive for us to continue because most directly, the thing that you are doing is theft. Bill Gates. Very good. You know who he wrote it to? He wrote it to hobbyists, specifically those in the homebrew computer club. <laughs> and you know what year he wrote it? I couldn't believe this, 1976. That's back when they were inventing software and doing things and putting it out for free. People were picking it up, copying it, and selling it. This one's a little more serious. Dear Emma, well, if you're reading this, I guess, I guess I didn't make it home and was not able to remind you again of how much I love you. Although I may not be here right now, take comfort that I'm watching over you. I'm not gone, and I'll always be with you in spirit. I know this time must be hard for you, but I also know how strong you are. Never forget that God knew what was best for us before we were even born. I want you to know just how important you are to me. I could not ask for a more caring, beautiful or loving wife. And though it seems like my life was cut short, I lived a life that most can only dream of. I married the perfect woman. I have the most amazing daughter that impresses me every day. So be strong for her. Remind her about her dad. And tell her that he loved her more than anything in the world. And tell her that Daddy's in heaven now, and will watch over her and protect her every minute of every day. Much better times are coming. You and Kylie have a wonderful life ahead of you, and I'm so happy I could share some of it with you. I love you. Sign your loving husband, Ty. Was a, a soldier? His name was Todd Weaver. He wrote it for his wife in the event that he wouldn't make it home from Afghanistan, which he didn't. In the second tour, he was killed in September of 2010. <clears throat> the article that carried that letter summarized it by saying, this letter 
is an achingly sad and poignant reminder of the great sacrifice being borne by our military and the need to cherish the ones we love in our lives, whether you're a soldier or a civilian. Okay, one more easy one. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not boastful, jealous, or proud, or rude. Who wrote it? St. Paul. To whom? To the church. Church? Where? Which one? Corinth. In Corinth? Very good. And what was it about? It was about love. Love is patient. Love is not. Well, I thought that since it, this Lenten season, we're doing a whole series of sermons on letters that were given by God, written by John, intended for seven churches in first century Asia. And they contain the deepest yearnings, hopes, dreams, wishes of Almighty God Himself. And today we're looking at the letter that was written to the church in a town called Thyatira. Now, if you were going to start reading the New Testament from the beginning to the end, you would see, for the first time, mention of Thyatira in the book of Acts. Let me tell you, just read a little bit to you. It says, We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across the island of Samothrace, and the next day we landed in Neapolis. Now, from there, we reached Philippi, a major city, of that district of Macedonia, that Roman colony. And we stayed there several days. And on a Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a river bank, and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira. She was a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. She was baptized, along with other members of her household, and she asked us to then become her guests. And that's the first time we hear about Thyatira in the Bible. Now, we're not sure, but a lot of people think that what Lydia did was, after she was converted to be a Christian, she went back home to Thyatira, and she started gathering people as she told them the story about Jesus and how he gave his life so that all might be saved. And they started forming a group, which is called a church. Now, if you lived back then, back there, that wouldn't have been a big deal. Because there were lots of groups with gods in the town of Thyatira. They called them guilds, or some today you might call them unions. It was people who had different trades who gathered together with those of their kinds. They'd form a club or a group or a, or a sect like that, and then they would pick out a god for them only. So there were like these groups all over town. Now, one of the major religions or gods that was worshipped was a god by the name of Apollo. He's a Greek god, god of prophecy, and people would flock to his temple to find out what life would hold for them. And so, and we don't know much about how they worship, but what we do know is they had a lot going on outside the church. There were horse races, and there were musical contests, and they would bring in celebrities sometime. Today they bring in uh, Greek stars such as Jennifer Aniston, Aniston, hello, or Olivia Dukakis, or Tommy Lee, who's the drummer for the Motley Crew. And in another religion in first century Thyatira was a reformation of Baalism. If you know anything about the Old Testament, that goes way, way back. And when you heard Katie reading about Jezebel, she was a queen way, way, way before Jesus, and Baal was her god. Something about Baals, Baalism was uh, not really too cool. First of all, they sacrificed children to the gods. So if you had a perfect gift with, with, that looked really cute, they would actually offer the child as a sacrifice. And the second thing that they also did is they practiced 
um, the fertility rites, which meant the church was staffed with beautiful women, and uh, in order to worship Baal, the men would come and get together with the women. Male attendance in church was a lot higher in those days. <laughs> But that's something that they had going on. But there were other gods too. Now we don't know exactly who they were, but if I was going to guess, there could have been Ichthus, the god of fishermen. The fishermen's guild, where every Sunday they would get together and go out and catch fish and drink exorbitant amounts of Paps Blue Ribbon and tell exorbitant lies about the one that got away. Or there could be the god called Mulligan. He was the god of golfers. <laughs> the golfing guild, where not only did they play the game, but they also created woods and irons and putties and putter putties, putters and titanium pot balls. Or there could have been the god Tecton, who was the god of woodworkers, who got together and made furniture and construction things and would sit around and gossip about the girls down at uh, the temple of Baal. Or there was the god Mamoa, perhaps, who was the god of the rich and the famous, whose sole goal was to earn as much money as they possibly can and not worry a thing about who they walked over or uh, who they sent to the unemployment line. I just made those up. Just, <laughs> you won't find those. But I wanted to give you an idea of what it could have been like in Thyatira when Lydia came and started to form a church which was going to worship God, Yahweh, Jesus, and they had certain methods of behaving that included being loving, forgiving, foregoing, chaste, honest, and sincere. So that's, the, after all that, that's the situation to which this letter was written by our Lord Jesus to the church in Thyatira. So what did he say? Let's look. He starts off, I see everything you're doing for me. Impressive. The love and the faith and the service and the persistence, yes, very impressive. You get better at it every day. It's like God saying, hey, you guys got this unconditional love thing down. You know what's going. And I have noticed how you care for the poor. You are so well. You've got faith. You've got love. You've got hope. You've got pers perseverance. Not to mention the way you're caring for the poor. And you're consistently sharing my story with other people so they'll come and believe in me too. Way to go, church! However, but, he says, I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat the food offered to <coughs> idols. The message paraphrases that same verse, but why do you let that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, mislead my dear servants into, catch this, cross-denying, self-indulgent religion? It's like Jesus is saying, hey, watch out. I'm serious about what I want you guys to be doing, and what they're doing is not right, and I'm going to give them exactly what they deserve. And then he goes and turns around again and offers a promise. And he said, I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly <coughs> to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious who obey me to the very end. And that's pretty much the message of the letter written to the church in Thyatira. Now, I probably don't really need to go on, because I think you can take that on your own, apply it to Emmanuel, but um, it's not time to leave yet, so I think I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> so, so what would happen if today, kind of based on this, God says, I have got a message for all the people sitting in Emmanuel Lutheran Church and watching on the internet, um, all the people that are watching and listening, what would God want to say to you? So let's pretend. Okay. 
Notice this. Pretend. That God gave me a message to give to you. From him. What would he say? I think, first of all, he'd say, I've seen the good things you're doing, and I am impressed. I see how you guys love each other. I've read those cards that some of you write to people who are in the hospital. I know what that is like. I have sent my Holy Spirit out, as you've sent little notes and cards to parents and godparents of all the children that have been baptized. And I go with my spirit. Sometimes I actually work a miracle. When you take the flowers that are here every week, you take them and you bring them to somebody that's shut in or something like that. And sometimes they get a little wilty. I just kind of give them a little boost. I do that for you. And maybe even more importantly, every week when your Stephen ministers go out and they try to help people who are hurting, I am there with them. Second, I think Jesus would say, you have faithfully offered a number of styles of worship so people in Palm City and the surrounding community can worship me in a number of different ways. Hey, I know Jesus says that not everybody likes classical music or everybody likes rock and roll. There's all sorts of things. And I am so proud of the way that you have done different things so that more and more people can worship me. And third, do I need to tell you again how happy I am that you feed my sheep, that you welcome the stranger, and that you're taking care of my kids out there at the Real Life Children's Ranch? You've got this service thing down. And not only that, you are persevering. You are hanging in there with all the changes that are going on in American religious culture today. I've seen your frustration when you see few and fewer people that actually go to church and everybody else doing else, something else. I see your, I feel your pain. But I am so proud that you are taking a concerted effort to do something about that and looking out, working together with me, you can build the church and to build those who love me and serve me and appreciate my gift. That's from Jesus to you. But, every letter has a but. I've got to warn you, there are severe repercussions for watering down my word. It's not healthy for you, and it's not healthy for my church. So don't compromise your theology. What you believe to be true about me is what is true about me. Don't give an inch of what I've taught you. And just in case you don't remember, let me remind you. First of all, the life that you have is a gift. It's from me to you. Second of all, the world you live in, it's yours to use. But always remember, it's not yours. It's mine. Your name may be on the deed today, but a hundred from years from now, a lot of people won't remember who you are. The world is yours. It's fragile. Take care of it. Third, look around at all the people near you. Look at all the people and think of all the people in your life. Every one of them is a gift from God. And I have intended for you to be living like you are a gift to someone else. Fourth, everything you experience in life is partial. Even the best things that ever happen to you, they're kind of like a, a reflection in a mirror that's kind of foggy because the world is marred with imperfection, with sin. So I want you to remember that the way to, way to deal with imperfection that's within and from without is through two things, confession and forgiveness. Humbly, humbly and meaningfully be able to say, I am sorry. And when someone says that they are sorry, be merciful, and generous in granting forgiveness. And fifth,
remember that the best gift of all is me. Now, I know that sounds conceited, but remember my father and I are one. He gave his all, and I gave my all. So that you would have all of life forever. So if you find yourself starting to slip slide away, just remember how much I love you because you are mine. Amen. Dear God, we give you thanks for all your many blessings, for life, for people. We give you thanks for all the people that you have given us to share the life which we enjoy. And today we ask you to be with those who are sick and who are hurting in need of your care. We pray today for Darlene, for Louise, for Pat, and for Helen. We remember Jim and Wilbur. Be with Mike and Judy. Your blessing, ask your blessing upon Billy and Barbara. Be with Eric and Rita. Send your healing power to Ken. Be with Megan and Michael. We ask you to watch over Karen and Nancy and Justin. Send your healing to Evelyn and to Nancy, to Carrie, Roy, to Sharon, to Katie and Ellen. And Lord, we ask that we would take the blessings that you're receive from you today and go out and enjoy the wonderful creation you've given us and that all of us always share the power and the love that we receive from you in Jesus name we pray
you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.